thank you for coming and welcome to our March installation of the QMUL and GSIP monthly seminar series. It's really nice to see you all here. Uh, tonight we've got two fantastic speakers talking about genomics of rare disease and other aspects of the genome. Um, we've got uh, Dr. Gavin Arno starting us off. Um, Dr. Arno did his PhD at St. George's University of London, uh, and after that he became scientific director of the Sonnelly Lab for Marfan Syndrome Research. In 2012 he moved to the Institute of Ophthalmology at UCL, um, where he joined the Inherited Eye Disease Lab, working with Professors Andrew Moore and Andrew Webster. He's currently a Fight for Sight Early Career Investigator uh, and the lead scientist on national and international collaborative uh, whole genome sequencing work. includes the National Institute uh, NIHR Bioresource Rare Disease Study and, of course, the 100,000 Genomes Project. Uh, and he's going to be talking to us about exploring the extra exome uh, using examples from inherited eye disease. So thank you very much, Gavin, and we're really excited about your talk. Thank you very much. So thank you for the introduction and the invitation to talk today. Okay, so let's begin with the retina then. So for those of you here who aren't obsessed with the back of the eye, um, this is the, the globe here and then this is a view this is uh, what we call a, a fundus image of the, the back of the eye. We're looking at the different structures of the retina here. The back of the eye, we're looking at the different structures of the retina here. And we can see the, the retina is made up of different cell layers. And it's these cells here, the rods and cones, the photoreceptors, that, uh, that convert um, a light impulse into, into an electrical signal via the bipolar cells, which they feed down the optic nerve to the brain. <clears throat> and we have a number of ways of, of looking at the back of the eye. We've got, uh, we've got a, 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 a coloured uh, white light shine, shining on the back of the eye here, which enables us to see the, uh, the RPE cells, the cells that support the neural retina, the, the vessels of the eye and the, the optic nerve here. And then by shining different kinds of lights on the eye and, and looking using different cameras, we can see, we can get an idea of the, the health and the wellness cell layers in the retina. And we can, we can look specifically in vivo in the patients in clinic at the different cell layers of the retina. And then taking it a bit further, we can, we can stimulate the retina with different types of flashes of light and we can measure the electrical signals generated by the retina and we can interrogate individual cell types using what's called electrophysiology and analysing the different waveforms that are generated by the retina. And this is what we see typically in disease. So this is a, a patient with retinitis pigmentosa or a rod cone dystrophy and this is characterised by uh, degeneration of the rod photoreceptors and this characteristic appearance of the, of the back of the eye, these, these black um, spicules, uh, they're defined as a, a pigment deposition um, signalling photoreceptor and RPE cell loss and what may not be so easy to see here, attenuation of the res retinal vasculature, so this is a very unhealthy retina. And then if we look using fundus autofluorescence imaging at the same patient we can see different features of the phenotype, so one thing that we can see here is this bright ring of, of fluorescence here in the centre. This is called hyper-autofluorescence. And this delineates the, the functional retina within that ring with the non-functional retina outside of that ring. And then using OCT imaging, we can see in a bit more detail, we can see the uh, photoreceptor cells are, are missing outside of that very central island of, of healthy retina. So what are inherited retinal dystrophies then? So a leading cause of global blindness in the UK, it's the commonest cause of blindness in working age adults. It's thought to affect blindness in working age adults. It's thought to affect about 2 million people worldwide. And it's characterised by dysfunction 
or degeneration of the retina or the RPE cells. And molecular diagnosis is challenging, and this is, this is due to several factors. So the, the phenotype is, is very broad and very, and very um, diverse. And then the uh, heterogeneity that we see at the, at the gene and the allele level is, is vast. So over 300 genes are so far associated with inherited retinal disease, and many thousands of different mutations have been found. And all inheritance patterns are observed. So in a case where a, uh, a new patient comes to clinic with no family history, it's very hard to, uh, to try, and, try and determine what may be the cause of disease in that patient. So for this reason, many families remain molecularly undiagnosed, and, and we don't know why this is, novel genes to be discovered. We're fairly sure that certain alleles of, of genes are accounting for unusual phenotypes or phenotypes not classically associated with those genes. Um, and we think that non-exonic variants and structural variants, which, which aren't typically found by traditional genetic testing, are important causes of disease. And then some other more exotic causes that we may, that we may be missing, mosaicism and, and uh, non-Mendelian inheritance, for example. And so we use inherited retinal dystrophy as a, as a model for broader Mendelian disease. And this, you know, I've highlighted some of the reasons why this works, you know, with the the high heterogeneity and the fact that we can interrogate the cells and the tissues that are affected and, and see exactly what's uh, dysfunctional or degenerative in those tissues. And so currently it's uh, dysfunctional or degenerative in those tissues. And so currently genetic testing in retinal dystrophy is, is performed in, in several different ways. So we still do direct Sanger sequencing of monogenic small genes um, and uh, mutation hotspots in single genes. And then more broadly, targeted gene panels are used, either targeted with probes, like at Manchester, or targeted with a virtual gene panel of a clinical exome at Great Ormond Street. But we're moving on to unbiased screening now, and uh, specifically whole genome sequencing and the, the 100,000 Genomes Project. We think this has several advantages. So it, it, its unbiased nature means that dosage is pre preserved in the data, which means it's far easier to analyze copy number variants compared to other technologies in gene panels or, or targeted exome sequencing. And we can analyze the intronic and control regions of genes and interrogate the vast majority of the whole genome. But there are challenges associated with whole genome sequencing. So there are still regions of the genome that we can't sequence. So repetitive regions that are longer than the short reads that we're using to sequence the genome, for example. And the huge amount of data that gen that's generated by whole genome sequencing is, is challenging to handle, challenging to process, and challenging to uh, perform variant filtering and prioritization. But Genomics England and other large data sets uh, that are available now, like the NOMAD data set, are helping to uh, overcome these issues. So the ophthalmology cases then in now, uh, like the NOMAD data set, are helping to uh, overcome these issues. So the ophthalmology cases then in, in Genomics England make up um, about 8% of all of the rare disease cases in the main study. Um, there are over 3,000 participants available in the, uh, in the research embassy now. In the ophthalmology subgroup, um, 2,600 of those have an ab abnormality in the posterior segment, so the, the retinal dystrophy cases are included in those. And there are 1,400 individuals who are affected with either a rod cone or a cone rod or a macular dystrophy. Um, and Moorfields has recruited a large proportion of those cases, so over 1,400 cases are recruited from Moorfields within the North Thames GMC. So the clinical pipeline, over 1,400 cases are recruited from Moorfields within the North Thames GMC. So the clinical pipeline um, is able to solve somewhere in the region of 50% of these, of these families, which leaves us uh, a large cohort to study 
in the research embassy. So what are we doing with these? Um, so several different approaches, including single gene interrogation. So where we have a family or a patient with a very characteristic phenotype or, or some information that points us towards one particular gene or a very small number of genes, we can look directly at that gene, look at the introns, look at the structural variant calls, and uh, detect variants in that way. So we expand that to monoallelic cases in res recessive disease genes. So patients who carry a no slightly more large-scale analysis, so doing cohort-wide analysis looking for recurrent, novel, and ultra-rare variants in the, um, in the ophthalmology cohort of patients in gel, looking at homozygous variants in consanguineous families and trying to unpick the, uh, the causative variants from the noise there. <coughs> and how do we do this? So non-coding variant analysis. So we're interested in, in very rare variants. We're, we're using different tools to predict the effect of these variants, whether it is predicted to alter splicing of an existing splice site or create a new deep intronic splice site, for example, or affect a regulatory region of a gene. Um, and then for recessive cases, the, the variants need to be biallelic or in trans with a convincing mutation on the other allele. And so we're taking candidate variants or in trans with a convincing mutation on the other allele. And so we're taking candidate variants from these analyses and performing in vitro functional testing in the wet lab. So we're doing RNA analysis, we're doing mini gene analysis and uh, luciferase assays and that sort of thing to test the effect of these variants. And then the structural variant analysis that we're doing is using the mantra and canvas structural variant calls, which are affecting um, at least one exon of one of the genes in our panel lab. And so we're looking to expand that outside of the coding region, so looking at um, deep intronic or, or, or intergenic structural variants to, to find novel causes of disease. And then a very small subset of these families have good linkage data. So there are some very interesting families recruited from Moorfields who, who've been studied for several decades and we still haven't managed to find a candidate variant that we could find in those cases. So I'm going to run through a few examples of what we've been finding using these techniques now. So these images are a patient um, seen at Moorfields Eye Hospital with, uh, with um, typical retinitis pigmentosa with uh, a, a, a dominant family history. So 29 genes are associated with, with dominant RP. Uh, one example of that is, is loss of function variants, so haploinsufficiency of the gene PRPF31. Um, and in NOMAD, this gene has a PLI score of 1, so there are no, no uh, haploinsufficient individuals in the NOMAD data set. But this gene has a high level of non-penetrance. And we think this is due to a rescue of the phenotype due to a high expression of the, of the rescue of the phenotype due to a high expression of the, of the wild type, the trans allele. So this chap, 57-year-old male, was, was diagnosed at the age of 26 pre-symptomatically um, with a maternal family history of RP, um, and he has two unaffected children, but he's very worried about his grandchildren. <clears throat> and so he was recruited to the 100,000 Genomes Project with his uh, affected mother and unaffected father. Um, and through the clinical interpretation pipeline, there were, there were no candidate variants, no hits, so and no primary findings um, report. And then we did some structural variant analysis, and we, we focused in on PRPF31 because it's very characteristic to see non-penetrance in this gene and, and to see a dominant family history. And we found um, an 11 kilobase deletion spanning several exons of PRPF31, which is shared with his mother. And this is how the browser, so we can see um, these, uh, these read pairs spanning this large segment of, of DNA, and this, this coincides with, with two almost identical ALU repeats spanning the, uh, spanning the deletion, so we think that this is a recombination effect, uh, event between these two ALU repeats, of course, leading to the deletion. 
So then another case of non-syndromic RP with, again, a dominant family history and evidence of non-penetrance in the family. Um, and prior uh, direct sequencing of the PRPF31 gene was performed in this family, which was negative. So again, this, uh, this family was recruited to the 100,000 Genomes Project, which, which led to a no primary findings report in the clinical pipeline. <clears throat> and so we performed similar an analysis, on, analysis on this case. No structural variants were found this time. Um, so we interrogated the introns of the um, posterior segment abnormalities gene panel. And we found there were 324 rare variants across the entire gene panel. So this is coding and non-coding variants. 155 of which were shared with the obligate carrier parent, so on the, on the right allele of, of, of this, of this uh, individual's genome. And 21 of those were predicted to have a possible cryptic splice effect. And only one of them was in our top candidate gene, PRPF31. And it was 569 nucleotides from the closest, closest exon. And what this variant does is alters a, um, a predicted um, deep intronic donor site at the plus three position, so changes this plus three from a C to a G, significantly strengthening the, uh, the predicted effect of that donor site. And so we're lucky with PRPF31 in that it's one of the very few retinal dystrophy genes that's ubiquitously expressed. So we can we can take a fresh blood sample from the patient and, and extract RNA and do RT-PCR spanning this exon. So going from uh, exon 8 to the last exon, exon 14, this is this variant found in intron 13. And we do that and we find that the, that the individual has an extra band in their RT-PCR, PCR, uh, and then we can sequence that band and we can find that there's an 88 base pair insertion, a pseudo-exon inclusion in that transcript, which, which leads to a frame shift and uh, loss. Those are two cases solved by structural variant analysis and deep intronic variant analysis, where we, we have a high suspicion of the gene of interest there. So something slightly different now, um, North Carolina macular dystrophy is a very rare um, congenital and stationary disorder affecting the central macula. Um, it has variable penetrance, so we see families with non-penetrance, we see lots of unaffected individuals in families who are obligate carriers of, of the uh, affected allele. Um, first identified in 1971, and two, um, two well-characterized loci have been, have been mapped in, in different families in this, in this, uh, with this phenotype with several other families with overlapping and similar phenotypes also, also having mapping to different regions. So also having mapping to different regions. So as of two, 2016, we had no idea of the cause of disease in, in any of these families after decades of work sequencing all candidate genes within each loci. And so at Moorfields, we've decided to do some whole genome sequencing on these cases. So we have... 27 families and about 130 individuals with DNA samples at Moorfields, some of which are mapped to the chromosome 6 locus, some are, uh, are mapped to the chromosome 5 locus, and then we've got some other families mapped elsewhere, uh, some unmapped families and some, some syndromic forms of the disease, which we've also mapped to chromosome 5. So whole genome sequencing was performed on these families as part of several projects, including the 100,000 Genomes Project, along with some array CGH analysis that we did as well. And then in 2000, performed on these families as part of several projects, including the 100,000 Genomes Project, along with some array CGH analysis that we did as well. And then in 2016, um, a chap called Kent Small and, and Ed Stone from California and, and Iowa found the cause of uh, North Carolina macular dystrophy in their families, and they found three different single nucleotide variants 13 kilobases away from the nearest gene, the genes PRDN13, 
which they defined, delineated as V1, V2 and V3, and then a 60 KB duplication overlapping the PRDM13 gene. And then in one more family they found a 900 KB duplication in an intronic, intergenic region of chromosome 5. And so they implicated PRDM13 at chromosome 6, and they, and they wondered whether this duplication, which actually followed on from this work, and in our cases we, we, we performed whole genome sequencing and excluded variants in, in any known inherited retinal dystrophy gene, which, which we already knew anyway. We excluded any coding variant in either locus, um, and we found one of our families had the V2 single nucleotide variant on chromosome 6, and 13 families had this very interesting, um, had one of two, sorry, one of two very interesting overlapping intergenic duplications at the chromosome 5 locus, and this included our MCDR4 family, which had previously been mapped to chromosome 14. Um, and so we defined an association between these deep intergenic duplications and, and developmental macular disease, and this is this is what the, the breakpoints of those um, dupli intergenic duplications and, and developmental macular disease. And this is, this is what the, the breakpoints of those um, duplications look like. So these weren't called by any of the structural variant algorithms very effectively. So we had, to, we had to manually interrogate the data to find these efficiently. And so these are the, uh, the breakpoints of two distinct overlapping uh, duplications many kilobases away from the nearest gene. And so what, what are these doing? Well, we still don't know. This is, this is under investigation at the moment by uh, Raquel Silva, a PhD student who's working on this. But we think um, we've defined this overlapping 39 KB region that's duplicated in all, all, the, all of the duplications so far found at chromosome 5. And we think this must be having some kind of regulatory effect on one of these nearby genes. Um, whole genome sequencing and the 100,000 genomes project enables full characterization of the variant landscape across the entire genome. And uh, these, are, these are a rich resource for, for discovery of, of novel causes of disease in, in inherited retinal dystrophy and Mendelian disease. Um, and in our opinion, so deep phenotyping is critical for um, accurate interpretation of the, of the genome data, the variant data. And it leads the interrogation of the genome um, and enables targeting of the, of the interrogation effectively. And so we think that non-coding and structural variants account for a, uh, a significant proportion of the missing heritability in, in inherited disease. Um, and these variants may represent a broad spectrum of, of disease variants. So we don't see very many rickety in, in inherited disease. Um, and these variants may represent a broad spectrum of, of disease variants. So we don't see very many recurrent or clustering of, of disease alleles here. Um, and so these are, so we're, we're beginning to be able to define um, intergenic variation as a cause of disease now and I think the, the linkage and the, the availability of, of large controlled data sets allows, allows this more effectively and so just to thank my collaborators uh, there are many more than this but these are the, this, this is the core team at, at Moorfields and, and UCL and uh, the NIHR bioresource collaborators and, and Manchester, I have to thank Jamie Ellingford in particular who I've been working quite closely with on the 100,000 genomes data. Thank you very much. We've got time for some questions. So we use all available splice prediction algorithms. So um, the, the Alamut software is, is quite useful if, if you've got access to that. Otherwise, um, to predict an effect of a, of a variant, then human splice finder is, is quite
quite effective, I find. And, and what, what I think is important is that you don't just detect the splice alteration that's caused by the variant itself, but you need to be able to find the upstream or downstream part, the splice alteration that's caused by the variant itself, but you need to be able to find the upstream or downstream partner splice site. So if you, if you identify a novel donor site, then you need to be able to find a, a strong enough acceptor site, close enough for that to make a cryptic exon. Otherwise, considering um, whether, whether the variant is close enough to a nearby exon in the canonical transcript to, to extend um, the exon into the intron, for example. So you've got to have all of the machinery predicted and, and in the intron for that, to, for that to work, I think. And most of the cases that we've found so far, that's, that rule has held true. So we, we predict the effect of the variant, we find its partner splice site, and then we test it in vitro. And usually we... we So these are, or yeah, these are tandem duplications. We've confirmed that by uh, by by doing breakpoint PCRs, and we identify the the novel piece of sequence in the genome. So they're definitely tandem duplications in all the cases that we've found so far. So yeah, that's that's a good question. So um, we use. Um, Obviously, we use things like the uh, eukaryotic promoter database to to determine whether our variant falls within the, the core promoter region. Um, to determine whether our variant falls within the, the core promoter region. Um, transcription factor binding predictions upstream of of, uh, of um, transcription start sites. We use all of that data. But I think so. If we find, as has been the case a couple of times, we find a a never seen before variant very close to the start of a gene that's highly implicated in, in our case, then we've got a strong enough a strong enough candidate to go on and we can take that and do in, in vitro assays to test whether it is really effective transcription. So it becomes more complicated I think when, when you've got if you want to do this genome wide and you want to look at the, the promoters of every gene and then it becomes more complicated. Um, that's a good question. I don't know that that exists. It would be a useful tool, certainly. Because, yeah, I mean, you think that would be useful tool. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask about these, I mean, I, uh, the excellent data I see here, like, rare single genome assays, that they have been So, yeah, so I think the phenotyping is the key there. So, um, I said that over 300 genes have been associated with inherited retinal dystrophy, but at the moment we're focusing on, on, the, patients who look, on the patients who look like a specific phenotype or they carry a, um, an allele in a recessive gene that's in keeping with their phenotype. So, an example would be the H2A gene, which is the commonest cause of, of non-syndromic retinitis pigmentosa. Um, and it's a very large gene, and lots of people carry lots of variation in that gene. But we're, we're used to being able to characterize the phenotype and, and, and using the clinical expertise that I have access to at Moorfields, assess whether H2A is a likely candidate for that gene, uh, for, that, for that individual and then we can take that back to the genome data and interrogate the introns of that gene. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. 
yeah, they seem to rely on having already an awful lot of knowledge about. Yes, I think that's I think that's key at the moment. I mean, I, I don't think we're good enough. Yeah, so I don't. Yeah, so I don't. I don't think we're good enough yet to be able to do this on a on a genome wide level, or even a even a whole gene panel level. Because we find lots of lots of variants in lots of genes, and we really don't know where to start. So, you know, we're trying to learn from these uh, from these characteristic cases, and, and you know, develop algorithms, develop protocols to to take that further. I think. Um, I had a question. So it looked like you had, in IVA, you had the two um, presumably unpaired bits of sequence. Did you perform de novo alignment in the research environment to, to, for your duplication? It seemed like you'd... Uh, no, we did not do that. Split no. read. So we, so we have a, a kind of manual way of, of interrogating split reads where if you'll have what we call uh, chimeric reads that, that partly align to one piece of sequence and partly don't align. And if you take that piece of sequence that doesn't align and you run that through a, a BLAT search, you can find where in the genome that's, that's aligning to. So that, that defines where the breakpoint is. So if you're all your, pe- all your family, you would go to the BAM and take the unaligned sequences? Yeah. And, yeah. and so you can use that. And, and, and that actually... So that not only defines where the other end of the of the breakpoint is, but it also allows you to very accurately detect whether there's any uh, small insertion within the breakpoint as well. Particularly for for deletions that we find, you can find you know you may find a 38 kb deletion with a with a five nucleotide insertion in this place, and you can you can define that very easily from from these chimeric reads. And then confirm it from from these chimeric reads, and then confirm it by sound sequencing if you if you feel it's necessary to do that. <laughs> but we, you know, we we we're, we're getting pretty good at doing that now, and 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 we trust the whole genome data. We trust the, the short read data to tell us exactly what is happening. All right, brilliant. So thank you very much. That thank you. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ariana Tucci. Um, she's a clinical geneticist who has uh, consistently worked uh, throughout her career to use uh, next generation sequencing to understand neurological disorders. Uh, she did her PhD at UCL with Professors Henry Holder of Disorders, and she's currently clinically attached to the North Thames GMC where she um, works in mainstreaming genomics for neurodegenerative disorders uh, and interpreting the 100,000 Genomes Project data. Luckily for us, she also works here at Genomics England and has done uh, some crucial research into the detection of um, short tandem repeat expansions from whole genome sequencing data. Uh, And as a result of this work, last year was awarded uh, an MRC Clinician Scientist uh, Fellowship Uh, So now she's going to be uh, starting her own research group to investigate the novel causes of repeat expansion diseases using data from the 100,000 Genomes Project. Uh, And I think that's what she's going to talk to us about this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's also a fantastic time to be a researcher working in genomics thanks to the 100,000 Genomes Project. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, the work that I will present has been carried out at Genomics England with the Rare Disease Bioinformatics team in collaboration with the UCL Institute of Neurology to develop the pipeline to detect the short-term repeat expansions in the 100,000 Genomes Project. 
So this is the outline of the talk. First, I will give an introduction on the short-term repeats expansions, then an overview, and then obviously conclusions and future direction. So what are short-term repeats? There are small DNA sequences that are repeated a number of times in a row. This is an example of uh, an STR taken from the human reference genome. As you can see, there is a th uh, three nucleotide sequence, CAG, which is repeated a number of times in a row. The short tandem repeat expansion is a unique type of mutation that causes the number of repeats within an STR to increase beyond the certain pathological threshold. There are a number of disorders that are caused by repeat expansions and they are collectively known as the repeat expansion disorders. So this is a list of the repeat expansion disorders. This is a bit of a busy slide, so I'm going to walk you through it. So first, when we talk about the repeat expansion disorders, this is a list of the repeat expansion disorders. This is a bit of a busy slide, so I'm going to walk you through it. So first, when we talk about the repeat expansion disorders, we're talking about diseases of the nervous system. So for example, we have fragile X, which is one of the most common causes of intellectual disability in children, but we also have Huntington disease, spinal cerebral ataxia, myotonic dystrophy, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, so late onset neurodegenerative disorders. Looking at the repeat motifs involved, most of the times it involves three nucleotides such as the CAG, but it varies. It can involve four, five, six nucleotides or even more complex uh, repeats such as uh, the one involved in myoclonic epilepsy. Looking at the size of the expansions, again, it varies, and it varies mostly depending on where the few units, maybe 10 or even 20, or very rarely by 100. Whilst for STRs that are in intronic region, the expansion can be dramatic and involve up to a few thousand repeat units. One of the features of short tandem repeats is that they are highly mutable and that the mutation arises gradually. So we have here a normal allele that will start expanding a bit to a range which we call intermediate of premutation. These, alle these alleles have expanded a bit not enough to cause the diseases, but most importantly, they have become unstable, which means that in future generations, they are more, most likely to transform into fully mutated pathogenic alleles. If we look at the correlations between the repeat size and the distribution in the allele, free, in the allele free, an inverse correlation with a large number of alleles uh, carrying repeats in the normal range and a small number of alleles carrying fully mutated, fully expanded alleles. And later on in the talk you will see that this pattern is represented in the 100,000 genome project population as well. This is a fragile X pedigree that clearly shows how the premutation in yellow slightly expands from one generation to another, so from 55 at the first generation, 75 the second, 90 the, the, the third generation, and then, uh, and then it's, it becomes a fully mutated expansion with the two affected offspring. So from a clinical genetics perspective, identify the participants or patients that carry premutations and lead is very, very important because it will affect their risk of having affected children. And very important because it will affect their risk of having affected children. So short tandem repeat expansions are detected, uh, while well, the gold standard method to detect them are PCA-based me methods, fragment analysis, and RP-PCR. In the last few years, a number of methods, and this is a growing list, have been developed to call STRs from next generation sequencing. I'm going to focus my talk on a tool, a tool uh, called Expansion Hunter. This slide summarizes the challenges of calling short tandem repeats from uh, short read sequencing. So on the y-axis you see the list of disorders, Huntington disease, Friedreich ataxia, SVNA, and so on. On the, on the x-axis, the repeat length. The different colors indicate the normal repeats, 
images in calling STRs for whole genome sequencing. So in principle, how do these callers or expansion hunter work specifically? By basically by looking in the BAM file and by taking advantage of the um, sequence flanking the repeat. So we'll take all the reads that contain the repeats and its flanking sequence and we'll realign the reads to the original place using the flanking uh, sequence. So for example, it will take the reads that completely spanning the repeat, and by using these reads, it will compute the exact repeat size for that STRs, but it, was, it will also use reads that flank the repeats either partially or totally, and in this case, it will um, compute a confidence interval for the repeat size. This is a pile-up graph which we found very good, 100,000 100, Genomes Project participants. Expansion Hunter predicted a genotype of 22 or 31. Sorry. Can you see the mouse moving or no? <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> oh, like that. Yeah, so genotypes 22 and 31. In the top part of the graph, you see the, num the reads that have been used to make this call, the reads that flank the repeat here, and the repeat itself, CTG, CTG, CTG. So this, this group of reads is informative in that it can give us the maximum number of reads that, that, that of, the, of repeats that are um, in these reads. In, the, in this part of the graph, we see the reads that completely span the repeat. So we have, we have some flanking sequence here, the repeat, CTG, CTG, and here we can count exactly the number of repeats within this read, and again some flanking. Going down, oops, well, we will have some more flanking and spanning, so and, and, and expansion hunter used it, use the, the reads that span the repeats to make the call and correctly call this uh, ataxin 2 uh, as having 22 and 31 repeats. So the detection of STRs in the 100,000 Genomes Project. As, as you know, that 100,000 Genome Project, project comprises whole genome sequencing data together with clin clinical data. Clinical data are uh, you know, diseases that participants are recruited under along with HPO terms that are used to describe the patients. We have HPO terms that are used to describe the patients. We assess 25 STRs loci now on up to nearly 43,000 whole genomes. The first thing that we did was to look at the allele frequency distribution so this is an example of the allele frequency distribution of Huntington's. On the y-axis, we see uh, the allele frequencies, and on the x-axis, the repeat size. This is in number of repeats. The blue line indicates the uh, reduced penetrance intermediate alleles, and the red line indicates the uh, fully expanded um, <coughs> threshold, so alleles. As expected, the, last, the vast majority of alleles were normal, but a few genomes did carry expanded repeats. So this is reassuring, but obvious pipeline you need to compare to, or to, to gold standard methods. So we went on to look at negative controls, and we did that by taking advantage of existing uh, gel participant that had been tested for a range of, of STRs prior to being recruited to the project in any normal NHS labs. So we contacted the labs and specifically at Queen Square Lab, Newcastle and Wessex and asked them to give us the data of the PCR test that these participants had. And so we collected a total of 512 PCR tests across 13 loci. And then we compared the estimations from whole genome sequencing from expansion hunter versus the PCR. So by looking at the concordance and co at calling qualitatively and alleles as non-expanded, we reach a 99.2 uh, and co at calling qualitatively and alleles as non-expanded, 
we reach a 99.2% uh, uh, concordance. So the, out of 512 tests, there were four discrepancies. And they were mainly due to bad quality basis at the end of the reads. Again, looking at the pilot graph was, was really uh, key to identify the problem with the call. So this is a mismatch example, an ataxin one call, which was called by PCR as uh, 25 and 26 repeats, an expansion hunter called 27 and 43. Again, upper part of the graph, we see, graph, we see the uh, reads um, flanking the repeat, with the repeat number here that goes up to 25, which is fine. So this is here, at the reads here, spanning the repeat, we have three uh, reads that completely span the repeat and have 27 uh, repeats, which is fine. Looking down this part of the graph, there is a one read here which contains um, a large number of uh, CTG repeats, and this is the one that has been called to, to say that there are 43 repeat units here. Zooming in into this repeat and looking at, at the quality of the base pair here towards the end of the read, we see that all these are um, lower cases. Lower case mean that this is a bad quality read. So this, this call needs to be trimmed back and this read cannot be Another example we had out of the four mismatches, two were fmr ones Again, the pileup graph here showing the uh, flanking repeats, the flanking reads, the reads spanning the repeats, and, and here this single read again, which is the one that has been used to call uh, this, uh, uh, this genotype as 55. Again, looking at the, at the quality of the reads, you see lower base, lower base pair indicating bad quality and other reads that cannot be used. So we can't reliably say that this is a, an expanded allele. Moving on to looking at the repeat sizes, we've compared what, what if, if, if how accurate Expansion Hunter was at telling at telling us uh, bit sizes, we've compared what, what if, if, if how accurate Expansion Hunter was at telling, at telling us uh, the size of the repeat. And as you can see, for some low size, this is an example for Huntington, there is a near perfect correlation between the PCR results and Expansion Hunter. Again, we are talking about you know, not expanded alleles, so this is sort of expected because they are all smaller than the read length. Same scenario for fmr1, again talking about not expanded alleles. Less, less nice scenario for other, uh, for other loci such as SCA3 and we are now repeating the, the PCRs at uh, Queen Square to see and try to understand what the problem was here. We went on to, to look at the expanded alleles and try to match the genomic data to the clinical positive uh, results, so fully mutated pathogenic expansion in a range of loci. So we have now confirmed two, FM, uh, two families with fmr one mutations, four with Huntington's, two with motor neuron disease, and then a mixture of uh, spinal cerebellar ataxias. So I will show you some examples here. The, this is one of the Huntington's uh, validated expansion. These are two sisters that were recruited to the project uh, because they had Huntington's or features of Huntington disease, but they had 38 repeats. And if you see here, again, the, the allele frequency versus the repeat size, these two alleles, they they uh, lie exactly here. So that was confirmed. They uh, lie exactly here. So that was confirmed. Fragile X, we've uh, 
confirmed two family. Again, looking at the allele frequencies versus the repeat sizes and focuses on, on the on the genomes that carry the largest uh, repeats, we see that this in blue come, they all come from one family. This is family two, with the proband carrying the largest allele and the mother carrying the smallest allele in the intermediate range. And same similar scenario for family one. Again, the proband and the mother, proband with a full mutation and the mother with a pre mutation. A problem that we notice with FMR1 and the reason why we're not is that although, although it's possible to pull out the very large allies and probably they are the ones that truly carry the expansions, if we look at the allies in the intermediate range, there is a, a large number of false positives, really. So it's a, much, it's a much higher number than expected, and we believe that this is false positives due, due to the fMR1 being on the X chromosome and being a, in a GC-rich region. Last example on the Friedreich ataxia. This is a biallelic gene on a singleton recruited under ataxia. So biallelic genes means that this individual carries two expanded alleles, as we can see. This individual carries two expanded alleles, as we can see here. This is the allele frequency distribution from frataxin, and these two uh, alleles coming from the same individuals that has been validated. This individual had a diagnosis of, well, of ataxia genetically unidentified, and, and, and thanks to the to this result, uh, was provided with a genetic diagnosis. This is a last slide on the work that we have started doing by benchmarking different colors. So we started comparing the output of Expansion Hunter versus another tool, which is called Gangsta, on, on the existing um, uh, on the existing positive controls that we've collected so far. So this is the list of the positive controls. In red is uh, the expanded uh, the expanded lead that has been detected by both Expansion Hunter and Gangster. But if you see here the C9 off, which is normally a large expansion with over 546 hexanucleotide repeats, is being detected by Expansion Hunter but not caught by Gangster. So this is still very preliminary and we're working to do more uh, comparisons using different colors to assess the performance of each one. So to conclude, we have now implemented a pipeline that detects short and repeats expansions from whole genome sequencing using Expansion Hunter. The pipeline is now automated and analyzes STRs in participants with the consistent disorders. Looking at the normal release, we see a 99.8% 90, concordance, mid concordance between PCR, which is the gold standard, to, um, to size STRs and expansion hunter, which is great. We're also recruiting more positive controls, and this will allow us to fully assess the performance of, of the pipeline and give us an idea of the specificity and the sensitivity of this pipeline. We have so far uh, detected and validated expansions in 15 different families, and we, are, we have been feeding those back with uh, ad hoc uh, um, correspondence with the GMCs. The important advantages of using Expansion Hunter, obviously, is that it, that it detects expansions that are larger than the read length, first of all, and second is that uh, by visualizing the reads that are used to make a call, it's possible to quickly assess the quality of each call. Something that I didn't say before is that it's short tandem repeats are estimated to cover up to 3% of the human genomes. However, they are largely unknown. So we know about the 20 or 30 or maybe 40 STRs that cause diseases 
plus a few thousands more that have been used traditionally for linkage analysis for population studies. However, it is estimated that there are over 700,000, up to a million STRs. So the next stage would be to, to try and identify novel STR expansions in neurological diseases. What, what we will be using is the 100,000 Genomes Project dataset. As you can see, the vast majority of patients recruited to the project have a neurological disease here. But current uh, um, data on diagnostic here, this is still preliminary. Uh, we know that we're, we have on diagnostic here, this is still preliminary. Uh, we know that we're, we have a diagnostic here that were about 30 to 35 percent in some cases for those patients, which leaves a large proportion undiagnosed. As I show you, we have these novel tools to call short term repeats, which I have just showed you and hopefully convinced you that work and work well. How are we going to do this? The first stage will be to define the, the profile of short term repeats landscape in the human uh, genomes using the, the entire 100,000 genomes project data set. And by defining the allelic spectra only of the repeat sizes and looking at the uh, allele frequencies, repeat size, but also, also taking into account different pattern of that variation or STR properties such as the sequence, we hope to identify work which will take place in the next few years, hopefully. So thank you very much to, first of all, to Christina, who is the bioinformatician who has done most of the work here, well, all of the work at Genomics England, the rest of the bioinformatics team at Genomics England, the clinical team, curation team, uh, uh, interpretation pipeline team. Uh, thanks to Illumina San Diego who helped us develop the pipeline, UCL Institute of Neurology with the work that, is being, that ha they have carried out and it's being carried out now for the validation and also uh, the Newcastle's and Wessex uh, genetics, genetics laboratory. And lastly, and most importantly, thanks to the participants of the 100,000 Genomes Project. Thank you very much, and we've got some time for questions. Thank you very much, and we've got some time for questions. From expansion hunter, or we don't set a limit. Oh, sorry, I see what you mean. Uh, we don't have enough data, I think, to. To, no, that's something we haven't looked at, and I don't think we have enough. With the short reach sequencing, you detect the presence of the expansion, especially for the larger expansion, the repeat size is not very accurate, obviously because they are re uh, repeats that are larger than the read length, and so the repeat size is less accurate. So that's something that maybe require more sophisticated technologies such as long read technology maybe. Yes, yes, we, I didn't put it in this talk because I didn't want to take the attention out, but actually, well, again, going back to our lovely graphs, um, this is after you can see an interruption. So we haven't worked out a way yet of, of detecting them. You see this uh, CTG, CTG, ATG, yes. ATG. So, so, Yes, then, yeah. The, definitely the next stage of, of this project would be 
to develop an algorithm to programmatically detect the interruptions because they have such an important role in stabilizing the repeat. So the expert great talk, but for the recessive of plants, the previous syntax two atoms, and that seems to be intractable. You can't tell the difference between two long ones and one very, very long one normal. So how did you, you need presumably trios to help you there, how did you, how did you um, diagnose that previous syntactic case as having two long or one normal? So how did you, you need presumably trios to help you there, how did you, how did you um, diagnose that previous syntactic case? Having two long ones. Yeah. Because they're both, they're both longer than your read length. Yeah, well, basically by the absence of a normal allele and by, by the, the good quality of these two uh, codes. Does it make sense? Sort of. But it's already very long. Yeah, okay. So there's the, the absence of a normal allele. Helps you. Yes. And then you just oh, take yes. the average. It's good size. Yeah, sizing, as I said, is not great for the very large ones, and especially it, it depends also on the sequence involved. But uh, uh, yeah, but basically, what well, it's really. Yes, it all. No, we haven't because we are working in, in the 100,000 genome strategy. We only have whole genome sequencing data, but it is, yeah. So is there a reason you stop at um, 13 base repeat units? Uh, you know, is, that, is that because of software problems or is that because they're just very rare and things like that size? Imagine in the genome there might be other repeats that have um, 20 base per repeat units. Um, is there a reason you stop at uh, we stop at 13. You said, you said the micro satellites are 2 to 13 base pair. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Um, is there a reason you use that 13 as a cutoff? I think it's a bad reason uh, of defining STRs. They are defining by, so they are defined by, I think, that the rate of mutability. So it's something more biological. But, yeah. Oh, he was referring to your first slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, 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 no. No. It's the it's the unit that's repeated. So the unit that's repeated can be co co can be comprised of two units, A C repeated thirty times, or thirteen units. Repeated five times. That's an STR. Does it make sense? Is it ever more than 13? That's what I think it can. Does it make sense? Is it ever more than 13? That's what I think it can be. I think it can be, I think it can be <laughs> but um, it's more of a. Like, I think you need model organisms to answer that question because it really depends on their repeating stability. You mean that have these mutations? Yes. Uh, no. no, they haven't been found. They're really interesting and fascinating bit is that they, they, co they really cause neurological that they, they, co they really cause neurological disorders. There are some other types of mutations that involve STRs, but they are more stable, so biologically a bit different that cause. Um, Syn other forms of syndromic, maybe intellectual disabilities, um, other forms of diseases, but not cardiovascular. I'm not aware of, at least. <laughs> so, from what I understand, that the expansion 
terms of pay power. If there is a region of pure compete, they can have a further compete length by the number of reads that they get. That, there's no way of knowing that those reads actually came from that compete, is there? There is. They have a bit. So, for example, for the C9 North expansion, oh, which okay, happens that's to be. Unusual one. That's exactly. The so, they, they have. Where, for instance, there are other transmutative peaks on the X chromosome forests, peaks on the X chromosome forests, you know, FMR2, for instance. Yeah. So yes. So, you can never really know, can you? It's unless, unless, well, you can't really know unless you can use the read pair mate. So, in other words, sorry. Here. So there is no other. So if if this is just CAG, then you would use this. If this is just CAG, CAG, you can. The only way of looking is really by looking at the number of genomes with g coverage normalized and and compare it to. But you've biased the selection with the design of expansion to by looking at those flanking reads, haven't you? Expanding reads are doesn't look at all. Expansions, and then ask the question, what is the flanking rate? That does happen with stretch models. Yes, yes, yes. So, so does that on expansion hunter then all that works a bit right. like stretch? So by knowing uh, a priori where the STRs are, as, well, STRs are, and if there is an excess of uh, and that reads with. Possibly they would expect to false positives because stretch would light up those other reasons as well, which is good. Yeah. Well, that's like a so the in repeat reads, are there any bits of the normal genome which would produce in repeat reads in the kind of way that you were talking about? Or do they only kind of these pathological expansion? Yes. Yes. So, for example, as we said, for uh, CNI North, this is exactly what happens. An expansion hunter has developed um, um, a part diciamo, of, of the program is to look at those regions where the oh. <laughs> tragedy <laughs> sorry so to look at the at <laughs> tragedy <laughs> sorry so to look at the at the regions where the reads that contain the repeat have mapped have mapped does it make sense but if you just see an uh, in-repeat read that's all CG genes, is there somewhere, are there bits of the normal genome that will have a CGG repeat mapped on that will be producing a whole new repeat read that will be all CG genes? Yes. And, and there's that part of CAGs as well and all the other? Are they all in that situation? Right? They are all in that situation. Oh, An expansion hunter looks in these genomic regions it knows upfront where those genomics regions are and pulls out the reads that contain these repeats. But how does it, sorry, how do you look in a, if, all, if your read is only CGG, then how do you look in any because, region that isn't? Yeah, yeah. If there are because they have been mapped by, by, by the, the aligners. Because, perhaps because they're not polymorphic, right? So you can say that, that these 50 go there. Because that's the coverage of that region. Is that how it would work? Uh, mm, I think. I mean, how many bases is a is an in repeat read? This is, it depends on, on, on the genome sequencing that you're using. So in our case, it's one, 150 base pair okay. times so two. All the bits of genome where there's 150 base pairs that all go CGG. I mean, if you're using something that's 150 CGG, then you don't know where it's coming from. No, but you know, you know the bits of the genomes oh. that have that CGG and you can take those reads. You, you wouldn't know where they come from, but <laughs> if there is an excess. Apart from the genome sequencing is largely being generated from data. And you can take those reads. You, you wouldn't know where they come from, but <laughs> if there is an excess. Apart from the genome sequencing is largely being generated from data. So you don't really understand Yeah, yeah, that's. Sorry, I meant not the one read. I meant I meant the whole pair. I meant IRR pair. No, no, I am. Perhaps we can continue over a glass of wine. Yeah, 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 yeah. I will tell. Yeah, no, but I, I see what you mean. Uh, is there any more pressing questions? 
Okay, so uh, at the Heart Centre, we've got some wine and some nibbles if anybody would like to continue uh, their evening with a chat and a drink. You're very welcome.